Hello, beautiful people. How's your day going? All right, so we're going to move to the next one of this course, which is Java syntax. All right, I want to quickly appreciate, um, apologize for not posting as frequent. All right, I've been having some exams at school, so please bear with me. Uh, so without further ado, let's move on into the course. So what is Java syntax? All right, the syntax of a programming language are the set of rules that define how a program, how a Java program is written and interpreted. So let me quickly show you a sample of a, a demo project, a sample uh, project, a Java code, right? What count? Let me show what count. All right. All right, so this is the code, right? That counts the number of words in a text file, and it's a Java code. So as you can see, if you look at this code, if you can re read English language, you see that the words there are familiar. These are words that you can pick up your dictionary and, uh, and find the meaning, all right? You have the public, it means public, right? You have class. So like a programming language, right? So there are rules to how you write it. It's not like you just um, uh, write an essay, all right? Although these are familiar English words, you, you, there are rules to how you combine them together to make a program, all right? So that's what I'm saying. So that's what the Java syntax is. So these are the topics we're going to be considering in this module. So first of all is the Java variables. What are Java variables? So variables are containers for st storing data values. Remember I said in the um, somewhere in the, uh, in the module of this course, in the uh, module before this course that um, that courses that no, pardon me, that um, Java automatically assigns memory for our variables. All right. So this is what I mean. So they are data values. All right. They are data values. So let me let me explain what I mean by clicking on this link. You see, this is the W3 uh, schools are linked. All right, so as you can see, these are variables. You have different uh, variable types, data types that like, uh, you can use in the uh, in, on, on Java, right? And we'll get to that in a minute. But as you can see, this this takes some memory. So, for example, okay, let's move on so I'll show you what I mean. So, there are different, there are many, um, uh, there are many data types, there are many Java data types out there, all right? But the ones we're going to focus on in this core, in this module, right? At least for the basic, in this basic uh, module, is at this file, all right, which is the int, which is an integer, the float, which is a decimal point number, a character, which is just a single uh, alphabetical character, I have the boolean, which is which is that holds true or false, and I have the string, which, which holds text value, all right. So um, let me let me let me show you other uh, uh, other distance out there, other data data types out there. All right, at this point, I might be sounding like your boring professor bombarding with all this theory without actually building. An app, all right. So just bear with me, all right. I'm going to be building an app, and these fundamentals are necessary, all right. So please pardon and stay with me, all right. So these are the other data types we have. All right, we have the byte. The byte is a number, is a, is a, is a number for holding whole numbers too, but it can only only hold numbers from between minus 128 to 127, all right. The short is another uh, is another variable, all right, for holding numbers, but it can only hold numbers from between minus 32,000 to plus 32,000. Approximately, right? Then we have the integer, which is by what um, for most of our design we'll be using, and it can hold numbers from between minus two billion to plus two billion, right? And that that will be sufficient enough for our application. But if you want to go bigger, like say you are building a bank application, you know some customers' balance might be beyond two billion, all right? So if you want to go bigger, we have the long, the long, which holds, which also holds whole numbers, but and this one can hold numbers from between two trillion. To, uh, from between minus two trillion to plus two trillion. All right, so that's how it works. And then we have the floats, the double. So these are these are the these things we have, right? And um, these these are what we have. So this is it. Let me quickly go back to show you what I mean. So now this is the variable name, the, the variable type rather. And this my norm is the variable name, and this is the literal. Literal is what you assign to a variable. All right. These are data variable type, a data type, primitive data type. These are data type. This is the uh, variable name and this is the literal, all right? A literal is what you assign to a variable, all right? In this case, these are uh, data type or variable type. These are variable name and these are literal, all right? So you get the idea. Now let's talk about naming conventions for a variable, all right? So the naming convention in Java is very important, all right? In English language, you might say money and money. They are not different, right? When Java is carrying significant difference. So you usually um, name um, variable names follow the camel casing formula. What is camel casing? Let me show you what camel casing is. All right, so, so this is camel casing. So as you can see, it follows the hunchback of a camel case. So if if you were, if for example you wanted to write something like um my name, you would you write it like this, my name. All right, this is camel casing. All right, that's what it is. You see the format, camel case. So each uh each the starting letter, the starting letter of each word will begin with a uh, capital letter. But to name a variable, each it must start with a small letter. Then the next word was be followed must be followed by a capital letter so for example as you can see here you have my text it starts with a small letter and this next word sounds begins with a capital letter all right so this is a convention right this is not like um 
it's a if you write it, it doesn't if you write it in capital letter, it will flag your uh, application as as um, but, um as error, but is a convention that is universally used, all right? So that if you, when you're working in the team, the team can understand you, all right? So there are, there are scenarios where you actually type your variable names in capital letter, but we'll, we'll get to that later, later in this course, all right? But the normal case is this. It must begin with a small letter, then the next one must begin with a capital letter, all right? I hope that's clear. So, um, okay, so you can read this, but you can read this. So now let's talk about reserved keywords in Java, all right? So these are keywords that you cannot use to name a variable. So let's open it up. Under no circumstance can you should you use this these keywords to name a variable. You should never do it. Right? These are reserved for Java's use only. They're reserved by the pro, by the uh, by Java programming language itself. So can't do this. So uh, to quickly uh, to um oh no uh, let's quickly create our Android project for this for this uh, uh module. So we're gonna open up Android Studio and you're gonna start a new Android project. I'm gonna click on empty activity and you're gonna call this Java syntax. Java syntax. And the language should be Java. Don't forget this. All right. And it doesn't matter the version, the API level you choose here. All right. Just it's just just a demo. So just let's leave it at um, twenty. And click on. Uh, let me bring this up and uh, click on finish. So all right. So we are here. So once you're here, all right. Once you're here, close this. But close this. So if this is collapsed for any reason, this was it was like this. Make sure you click open project and click on this circle. Uh, icon here click on it then come here and click on this is a package name click on it and click on new then java class call this main all right i leave everything as this then click ok all right then close this one and let this be all right so this is where we're going to be demonstrating a lot of what uh, our app does um uh, a lot, uh, what we're going to be this is where i'm going to be demonstrating uh, some of the concepts i'm going to be introducing to you in this uh module all right so um uh, first off let's let's so i've talked about so these are the reserved keywords all right so um Okay, so let's move on. So, code comment. So, before I move on, let me show you something. Okay, so. Okay, sorry for that. But just copy and paste this code. I'm going to be. Um, it's not necessary you know what this does right now. Just do, just write this code here. This, and write it. Just paste it within this main class you just created, right? Just paste it here. All right? Just leave it like that. All right, so. So um let me let me uh, quickly demonstrate the variables we have before we had int wait let me go back so let me go back so so these are okay let me copy this so let me paste all this in here all right so as you can see we have the integer number five so um so we're gonna be printing each of these um uh to this to the our console all right. So I'm going to be printing all of them to the console. So we're going to, you're going to, to print this to your console. You're going to use system dot out dot print line. And you're going to you want to print my number to your to your uh, console, my norm. Then you come down, press Control D on the system or command if you're on the Mac. Then do the same for float. So what the objective is? All these variables we want to print them to the screen, all right? So I see everything. I go over here, all right? As you can see, I'm copying. Press Ctrl D, then I'm pasting in what I want to print. So you're going to come here, right? This play icon, you're going to click on it and say run main dot main, all right? So you understood it's going to run it. You're going to see, all right? Okay, something is wrong. Something is wrong. What could be? So let me try again. All right, so that was an error. So if it doesn't work, try it again. So as you can see, these are variables, and we've printed them out. So the first one was my number, we printed out five. The second one was the decimal point number, which was a float, we printed it out. Then the next one was the character. Then it was the boolean, which is either true or false, and in this case it was true. And I have the string, which contains a text file, which is hello. So that's it. So um, let's move on to the next uh, stuff. So com code commenting. All right, so we already have this, right? We already have this. So this what you're seeing here is a comment. And what's the purpose of a comment? The purpose of a comment is for you to for, to make it. Let me give you the official de uh, the definition I put here. Java comments are used in programs to make the code more understandable. Right? That's the purpose of a comment. Right? To make it more understandable. So this is a comment, and this will not get. This will not be executed. As you can see, it is gray. It means it will not be executed with our program here. All right? As it is gray here. So this is what. This is an example of what we call the single line comment. Right? Because it's in a single line. Let's say I want to write a, a bunch of things. Right? Don't I want to write a bunch of things? And how did I do that? 
uh, you, you press uh, the forward slash, then the asterisk, then asterisk again, then forward slash. So there you have a comment. Then you can press enter and you have that. So now here you can write here below the below code code prints out all of the variables variables above. As you can see, this is a multi line comment. So if you want to write a long sentence, this is what you use instead of this. All right. Hope I'm clear. So that's what that is. So um, so as you can see, this is a single line comment, and if you want to write multiple comment, this is how you do it. So let's move on to operators, Java operators. So the first one we're going to be looking at is what we call the uh, assignment, uh, the arithmetic operators, right? So we have the plus, have the plus, have the uh, have the subtraction, and the oh my god. Okay, so okay, okay, so. We have the plus, we have the subtraction, we have the multiplication, and we have the uh, all of those, right? So first, let me demonstrate them one after the other. These are just normal uh, more, um, mathematical uh, uh, operations, all right? So let me let me demonstrate. So let's have number int integer. Uh -huh. You remember I said there are keywords you can't use in Java. For example, the keywords, some of the keywords like new, you can't use it to name a variable. As you can see, we have this uh, red line, which, which signifies an error, right? So we can't use keywords. All every blue. Uh, Every uh, blue word highlighted in blue is a keyword, right? So you are not expected to use them, right? Not expected to use them in naming any of your variables. So you can use. And I brought out the list of keywords for you at the time. I hope I did. Yeah, I did. I did. I opened the. I'm saying okay. So under no circumstance should you use should you use any of these keywords to name your variables to result in an error, right? And it's not hard to understand. It's not hard to um. It's not, you don't need to memorize this, and that's the purpose of an ID. Once you have an ID, it will automatically tell you that this is a reserve keyword you can use. So let's go back to my number. As you can see, just click enter. All right, so let me let's have another number. All right, so let's move this to another line, to another method. So I'm going to create this method. I'm going to call this uh, the first part of this course, which is called what? It was called the first thing we did was called variable types. So I'm going to create a method called variable types. Although you might not know what I'm typing, just type it and um, we'll get to it later in the course. All right, so type public. Variable types, variable types. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna type public void. All right, so I'm gonna copy all this. I'm gonna paste it in here. All right. So, um, so if I execute this now, you, the all we have before in this small box would not would not uh, would not show. All right, and that's because I moved this to a new method. Right, if I want to execute what's in this block, all I have to do is call this method. I have to do that by saying and doing this. Uh, what's wrong? Oh yeah. What's wrong? Oh yeah. Okay, so um, let's leave that for now. Okay, let's just proceed. So, uh, we're going to be doing uh, looking at the arithmetic operators, right? So to demonstrate, let's say we have an integer a, right? And integer a is two, right? And let's look at integer b, and it's uh, integer b is three, right? And let's um let's do the addition and subtraction. Let's use the operators and see how it works. So let's look at integers results. Let's name this result and say integer result uh, um add add which will be a plus b, right? Result subtract will be um let's say b minus a because we know that b minus b is higher than a. So result multiply. Right, as you can see the camel casing, see how I'm writing my variable names. And let's say int int divide, result divide. Divide equals to a divided by or let's make this four, right? So let's make it four divided by two. Ah no. B divided by a. Right? Then we have this um result modulus, right? Modulus. Uh, let's have a C, right? Let's have a C, which is five. But let's call it seven. And let's say, um, um, C modulo seven, right? C modulo seven. Then we have the another operator called. Okay, let's. These are the basic operators, right? These are the basic operators you use in your normal application. So, this code right here would, would perform a normal uh, arithmetic operation, right? When we add, so let's let me print all of them out for you, so that we see what is going on. So we're going to print result add and see what All 
right? Right? We do the same thing for all of them. Result multiply. I know you know. Um, I hope you. I know you know what this would um turn out to. But I want to demonstrate it nonetheless so that you see. Result multiply. And then we have this. All right. So let me run this. Come back here and click on run. Or don't worry, let's click on run. All right. So this is it. 2 plus 4, which is a plus b, is 6. Result add equals 6, right? Subtract. 4 minus 2 is 2, right? Then we have b multiplied by a, which is 4 times 2, and is equal to 8, right? Then we have b divided by a, which is 4 divided by 2, which is 2. Then we have c modulo 7, uh, which is an error, right? Let me correct that. We should have been, let's use our variables. Should have been c modulo a, right? And C modulo A will be 7 divided 7 modulo 2. And that should give you 1, right? And what is a modulo? Modulo is the remainder of remainder when dividing. So when you divide 7 by 2, you have 6 remainder 1. And that one is the modulus, all right? So let me show you the official documentation I have here. So this is it. This operator returns a remainder in the division operation, all right? So 7 divided by 2, 7 divided by 2, we give you 3.5, right? Which is the same as saying 3. Remainder one, right? So that's what that does. So let's move on. Okay, so let me demonstrate the remaining, um, the remaining um, uh, operators, the remaining arithmetic operators. So let's come down here. We already have this. So let's come down here. I'm going to call this int x. I'm going to call it ten. I'm going to write int y. I'm going to call it uh, fifty. Or fifty, yeah. So if I say, if I come out and say, if I come here and say, system dot in x equals 2. If I do come here and say, uh, I put this in bracket, and say x plus plus. I want to show you what it means before I actually explain what it does. So if I come here and say x plus plus, and I come here, and I do uh, y equals to y minus minus. So let me run this so I can show you what it does. Okay, no, no, no. there's an error. There's an error. Okay, okay let me, let me, okay, let me, there's an error. So let me, so let's have x plus plus here, and let's just have x here. What is that y? So you see what I'm saying? All right. So as you can see, what did x plus plus do to this x value? Originally it was ten, right? But when you do x plus plus, it automatically increases the value by one. So instead of doing x equals two, x plus one, this is the same as x equals to x plus one, all right? All right, that's what this does. It increments the value by one, and this this does the same thing too, only that it decreases the value by one. All right, all right, that's what that does. All right, so we are done with this section. So let me copy all of this and move it to a new method. So how do you create a method? Let me cut it first. So how do you create a method in Java? You do public, you do void, and you do the name of this section was arithmetic operators, right? Arithmetic operators. And I'll go and paste this thing. Alright, so let's move on to the next uh, part. Alright, so this is empty. So if we run it, nothing will show. Alright, it's still empty, right? So let's move on to the next thing, which is the assignment operators. Alright, these are the operators. Now the equals to, the plus equals to, the minus equals to, the asterisk equals to, the plus slash equals to, the percentage equals to. Right, so um, let me demonstrate that to you. So first of all, the assignment equals to. All right, so in mathematics, you already know that. Let's say we have int index. Let's call this index and say index equals to five. In mathematics, you might this equals to means you are equating something to something. But no, in Java, this means you are assigning something to something. So in this case, what you have here, we are assigning, which is why it is called assignment operator. We are assigning three to index to this integer named index. Right, that's what we are doing. It doesn't mean we are equating. If you want to compare something in Java, you use the double sign equation. Double sign, double equation, double equal sign. This is where you use to compare if something is equal to something. But if you want, to, we'll get to that in a minute. But this is an assignment. You assign with one equals to, right? That's that. That's how equals to works. Now let's move on to the plus equals to, right? So let's say we have um, let's call this um, I don't know m. Let's call this n. All right? Let's call this um ten. 
I wanted to do um 10 plus m plus um n, right? I wanted to do m plus n. What you do, and let's say result, let's let's have in result equals to zero. You know 10 plus um 10 plus 10 plus 3 is equal to 13, right? I wanted to do that. What you have to do instead of doing okay, you wanted to do 10 plus 3, right? Let's remove this for now. I wanted to do the plus equation sign. Now, there are scenarios where you use this, and that's the purpose of the, the next module where we we'll demonstrate how all of this is used, all right? So just follow for now. So if you wanted to do that, and okay, let's do 10 plus 3, m plus n. I wanted to equate it to be to n, m to carry the value, m, right? m for Montreal. So I wanted to do m so that at the end of the day, m is the one equals to 13, all right? You could do it like this. Initially, let's print out some results. Let's print out some results. I don't want to write it, so that's why I'm copying it. Let's say initial value. M initial equals to M, right? We have N initial equals to N, right? Then we have M final. Which means we've added the value and we've assigned it to M, right? So let's print this. So click on plus here. So M final is 13, right? As it should be. But instead of writing this, you could just do this. N. I need to produce the same results. So let me clear this. All right, as you can see. So there are some times you want to do this in your when you're developing an app. So sometimes you want to increment a value. You don't want to create a separate variable to hold that incrementation. Incrementation. There's a word like that. So that's what you do. You use the plus m for. So let's do the negative. The negative. Uh, so the negative. Okay. So let me do the plus. This uh, same as m equals to m plus n right so let's do the negative version so um let's call let's copy this let's call this p let's call this q let's say this is five and this is four uh, okay p initial p q initial goes to q right so let's see q q minus p I mean p is q minus equals to same as p equals to um p minus mm. let's for reference let's make this 11 right so um so p final equals to p all right so let's run this so if you did 11 minus 4 you get 7 and if you did if you did it this way, it's the same answer, right? So let's change it to five. You see, it will be one. So let's run it again. So that's what that does, right? So let's do it for the multiplication, which is the same thing. So if we do the multiplication version, at this point I'm going to be just I'm going to use just going to go with the multiplication. I'm just going to go with um x and s and uh, I don't know a and b. Where is a and b here? No. So I'm going to go with the multiplication version. Okay, so B, A, A, B, and if you change this to multiplication, it's the same as P equals to this. I hope you're getting the idea. So A, B. So, all right. So that's how that works. So let me, if I run it again, so that'll be 5 times 4, that'll be 20, all right? So, as you can see, the answer is here. The answer is 20. Um, <clears throat> where did you go to, my friend? <clears throat> so, um... So you got the drift, which is the which should it be P? No, that should be A final, not P. So you got the drift. So it's the same thing basically with this and this. So let me that, those ones be your assignment. That's be the divide equals to. So the, the once you have something like this, right? Anything like this, it is usually the right side equals to right side again, whatever the operator is. 
maybe minus plus multiply division or modulus whatever it is and left side that's just the formula so that's just the trick there so whatever you get that's what this would equate to it's a short form of writing this all right so the remaining two these two you're you are going to do it yourself and see what you get all right so i'm going to leave it to it. so i'm going to create uh, an assignment operator we're going to create a new method so i'll be create a method in, in java do public do void um what's it called again um assignment operators Should be small data. I'm gonna copy all of this. I'm gonna paste it in there. All right. So let's move on to the next um, operator. So we have the logical operators. All right. Logical operators. Hmm. So in order to demonstrate how this works for you, so I'm gonna come here. You have the and and. You have the and and. We have the double slash, right? And we have this, all right? Okay, so um, let me jump a bit, right? And introduce something to you. So let's say you have int a goes to 12, and int b goes to 5, all right? And you want to do something like if, although when, um, when you are programming a real application, all of the values will not be as fixed as this, all right? Some will be from, uh, m most of them will be from user input, all right? But for the purpose of Demonstration that's why I'm using fixed values here, right? So let's say you want to do a if a is um if a is greater than 10 and b is less than 10, we can do something here, which is the case, all right? So as you can see, it's telling us that both cases are true, so it's just what just follow along. And this and means if this is true and this is true, we'll only uh, how do I explain this now? Okay, so this will evaluate to a Boolean variable, which is either true or false. All right, you've done, I hope you've done something along the lines of logic, right? So if you have this, will evaluate to true. Why? Because this and this are both true. If one of this is false, this will evaluate to false. All right, so as you can see, it's showing true here, right? Condition is always true, right? So let me change this to greater than. This will be false. Why? It's because only one of the two conditions is true. Although a is greater than 10, b is not greater than 10. So we have a false condition here. It means this will not execute. This if condition will only, will only execute if the expression inside here is true. I hope you understand. Let me explain again. We have the and and condition. And what the and and condition does is it, it tries to evaluate to a Boolean variable, right? Like all logical variables. It tries to um, return a Boolean, which is either true or false. And in an and and operator, what you are comparing it against, both of them, both of the conditions must be true. Both of the expressions must be true. Is A, as in this, in this example, is A greater than 10? Yes. Is B greater than 10? False. Which means this will evaluate to false. On the other hand, if we have the ant, if we have this all sign, which is called all, logical all, the, the, the previous one, which is this, let me, let me duplicate this, this, this condition, which is called the logical and all, this logical and would only, uh, will be true if one of the conditions is true, right? Any of the condition, if any of the conditions are true, this will evaluate to true. All right. So what am I talking? So is a greater than ten? Yes. Is b greater than ten? No. But this will evaluate to true because we use the or, or, or logical or. All right. We we'll use this in the greater detail. All right. So let's move on to the next one, which is um the logical knot. So the logical knot might not make sense, but just follow along. So if we do something like logical. Okay. So the logical knot is used to is used to flip. Um. A boolean variable so let's say you have boolean you have boolean true true bool we're gonna call this true bool we're gonna call it true right false we're gonna true it's usually used to flip a boolean variable so you want to flip this right and the full uh, implementation of this will be more appreciated when you are building something more significant than this basic uh, something so Flip, let's say flip true bool, flip true, true bool, and it's automatically flip it to false. If we do something like this, it will turn it to false. And if we do flip false bool, and let's click on run, but you know, I'm click, I'm click. oh wait, oh sorry, let's, I change this, let me change false, my turn, 
Right. So it would no, notice what it did here. It flipped this true bull into false and flipped this false bull into true. That's what it did. Simple as simple as that. Right. So the next up, um, okay. So let me let me move all of this into a into another method. Copy it. <clears throat> Public void um, logical operators. All right. So um, let's run again. It should be empty by now. <clears throat> All right. So let's move to the next. Uh, next. Um, next operators, which are called the relational operators. All right, so these are the list of relational operators. You use it to relate from one variable to another, from one variable to another. So I'm not going. I'm, I'm going to demonstrate it with statements. All right. So, so bitwise operators. Uh, these are also type of operators, but for our for for, for beginners, it's not necessary for us to know more about it. Right. And as the name suggests, bitwise operators are used to manipulate bits. And what are bits? Bits are just ones and zeros. So if you want to manipulate numbers on the level of bits, all right, that is when you use bitwise operators, right? I look them up as an assignment if you are really interested, but for a level, it's not really important. So, let's look at Java statement, Java expression statements and blocks, all right? So, when you combine uh, variables and literals and operators, you get an expression and statement. So, let's look at the official, um, the official, oh, the official, uh, let me look for Java expressions. statement right oh, yeah the official documentation so that was a wrong link all right so an expression is a construct made up of variables operators and method invocation so uh, i'm just going to leave it leave it at this right so this for example is an expression this is an expression this is an expression right but a statement on the other hand hierarchy forms forms a complete unit of execution the following types all right so no, I don't want to spend too much time on this semantic, too much time on this semantic uh, differences. So I'm just gonna move on. So we have the different types of statements. So what are statements? Java programs, right? They are usually executed in a linear or sequential form, right? As as we as it happened here. Right? If I put if I execute this, if I execute this again, you see it, it goes from top to bottom, right? Or our, our control statement is for is to enable decision making and looping, right? And branching of your app. So sometimes the programmer wants to break the normal flow and jump to another statement or execute a set of statements repeatedly. The statement will break the normal sequential flow of the programmer called control statement. All right, that's just what it is. So let's look at them so that you can appreciate them better. All right, so um, let's copy. I'm going to copy this code. We have different. Okay, let me look at. Let's look at the different control statements we have. So we have the conditional control statement and the switch control statement. So let's go to the um, conditional control statement. I know this might be boring. Um, I but just pay attention, uh, just flow with me, all right? So I'm going to copy this code and input it into my app, into our project. All right, so I'm going to paste it here. So once you paste that code, all right, just click on Alt Enter or Option Enter if you're on Mac. All right, and import, just click Import Class, right? Now, what, is, what does this line of code do? It generates a random number from, be, from between 0 and 9. That's what it does. Right, and here I print the value of i, you know, the random value generated here. I print it to the I print it, and if that value is less than or equal to 3, print i is less than or equal to 3. Right, if the value is less than or equal to 6, we print i is less than or equal to 6, else we say i is greater than 6. All right, so before we use this um, uh, random number, let's, let's let's use a number of non value, let's say 15, and let's run this. Let me forget this, and you can see. The value of i is 15, i is greater than 6. So this is a control flow. So that is what a conditional control flow is. It uses a series of if and else statements to get to what you want to do. Alright? It's a, a, series of, it's a series of if and else statements. So, and you can see you have this expression inside, inside this. That's how you write an, a, a conditional control statement. Alright? So you want to control if certain condition is met. Alright? If only a certain condition is met. So let's go back to generating a a random number, All right? So I'm going to click one. So it generated two, and i is less than or equal to three, which is true. So this is executed because of this, All right? That's what that does. That's how you write it. So um, if you if you write only one control, write only one control, and 
So this is it, alright? Basically, this is it. I don't want to overflow this. So the next next up is the switch statement. The switch statement, and um, let me show you. Alright, so this is the switch statement. I'm going to copy this code and paste it in. Okay, so before I paste it in, let me create a method for our conditional control statement. Alright, let me just duplicate this. Conditional control statement. I'm going to just paste it in. Alright, so, oh, sorry. Yes, that's it, that's it. So I'm free to clear this. And I'm free to bring in our new code. Alright, so this is the switch case. Alright, so let me change this to small case. Small. Small case. So the switch case, as you can see here, is for when you want to when you want to execute um when you want to execute code for for a specific value, alright? In the in, for example, in the if else statement. Is for although you can use the, the equality sign here to say if to to do this to equate if i is equal to three you can do it but this is much more cleaner to use if you want to do something that wants to perform a specific function all right so use the switch case function here we generate a random number between zero and um, ten and we say if the number is zero we say i prints i is equal to zero if the i is equal to one prints i is equal to one right but if but default is it means if these conditions are not met, one or zero, just print i is greater than or equal to one. All right? That's just that. So I'm gonna print. I'm gonna run this, and as you can see, it generated the random number generated was nine. I is greater than. Oh, sorry. I should have. I is greater than one, which is true. It's true. So i is greater than one. So this is how you do a switch statement. All right. So let me create a new method for it. Switch. 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 Next up, we're going to be looking at iteration statements, right? Iteration statement. Iteration statement a statement that creates a loop until a condition turns false. And we have three of those iteration statements, right? So let's say you want to um uh you have uh, a list of let's say you you want to access the list of contacts in the device in the, in the, in the user's phone, right? You can loop through until you get to the end, right? So that's what this iteration statement does. Or you have a list of photos in your gallery that you want to access. You can use the iteration statement to go through all of those pictures one after the other, right? This is one of the uses of the iteration statement. I have three. The first one is the while loop. While loop, right? So let me copy this code. Let me go back. So the while loop. While loop. So this is a while loop. And what do we have here? We have the um, initial uh, variable, which is i equals to zero. We check, we do while i is less than or equals to 10, all right? As long as y, i is less than or equals to 10, this while loop will continue running, right? And we say print loop, the index of the loop, right? And we increment the, the variable by one. So let me print this. As you can see, it looped from zero to 10, all right? So assuming I, I, I run this line of code, this code will, run, will perpetually run forever, all right? And will eventually cause an error. As you can see, it's running forever and ever and ever until we stop it, and it will cause your system to freeze, right? So that's why I incremented this. So after each loop, it will increment this by one, right? After the first loop, it will increase by one. Then the next two, three, like that. So let me run it again and demonstrate. As you can see, zero, one, the power of this i plus plus two, three, four. As you can see, right? Now you can see the advantage of this plus plus. Now let's let me demonstrate the term. The minus minus for you. Okay, let me let me do this. So we have ten. Let's call this i. Let's call this j. That's ten. Let's call this um, greater than or equal to zero. Let's say j minus minus. You see the same. Oh, something's wrong. Okay, something's wrong. Right? So. Let me comment this out for the moment so that we can see how this works. We're going to run this. Okay, so what's something wrong? Something's wrong. Okay, this with J. With J. All right. So let's run this. Oh boy. I've been recording for a while now. Okay, let me cancel this one. Alright, so as you can see, it came from down from 10 to 0. 
right? So what we do, what do we do here? We say the expression if while j is greater than or equal to zero. So the first iteration is is j greater than or equal to zero? J, of course, it is j, is, j which is ten is greater than zero. It will run. It will subtract, right? Which is the minus minus we have here. To subtract, then like that, like that, like that, right? I hope you can see how we've combined the while loop with uh, some uh, relational uh, operators and arithmetic operator, right? So let me comment this. And you know how the the uh, while loop works. So let's let's move on to the let's move on to the uh, next loop, the next type of loop, which is the do while loop, right? So I'm going to copy this code. So I'm going to explain it. The do while loop. Okay, something's wrong. What's wrong? Okay, let me call this um k. Okay, k plus plus. And call this k. Now, what is the difference between this and the while loop? All right. So let me let me remove this. I don't want confusion. So, what's the difference between this and this and the while loop? The difference between this and this is that. Okay, let me put k. Is that this the do while loop will run at least once. In this loop, the in this loop, the code is ex, ex, always executed at least once. It is also tested after every iteration. So, for example, in the while loop, if the condition is met, let's say ten equals ten, it will not execute at all. Let me let me demonstrate. Let me comment this out. If this is equal to ten, this will not bother to execute at all. Mm, some goes off. Right. So let's see. So this will not bother to be executed at all, right? This will not be executed at all. But in the case of this, when the case of this, when the do while loop, it will be executed at least once. So let me let, me, let, let the same condition here, which is this was this one will not execute at all, right? But this will execute at least once. Do while let me just separate them. So so this would execute at least once before checking the condition is met or not, all right? So that's the fundamental difference between them. This would check the condition before it iterates the between before it does the first iteration, but the the, the do while loop will will it will uh, iterate first then check the condition later, all right? So next up, let's move to the most popular loop, all right? The do while loop is not as used as much as the while and for loop, and for loop is the most used loop when developing an app. So let's look at the for loop, right? Which is the most popular looping uh, stuff. Looping. Um, oh, uh, this is an error. This shouldn't be this. But let me show you quickly how to do a for loop. So this is how you do it. for loop. Write the keyword for. I write integer index. Call it zero. You put a uh, semicolon. Put index. You put the expression you want until it expires. Next less than ten. And you say index plus plus. This is just a much cleaner way of writing a while loop. Right? It's a much more cleaner way of writing a while loop. Right? So if you look at the while loop down here, it's essentially the same thing we did. We, con we converted everything to a single line of code here. All of the expressions into a line of code. So what, what does this mean? This will execute until um until this index number is, is greater than 10. Right? The condition for executing is only when index is less than 10. Right? So after every iteration, this would um this would increment by one. So let me let's print this. Uh, while well, let's call this while well, let's call this um index let's call this index and let's call this for loop all right as you can see for loop is the same execution as a while loop right no difference what is the for loop is a much more cleaner way of writing a while loop all right so that's that so um let's move on to the next which is the jump statements. So let me let me uh, let me move this into an, uh, a a a a, a, uh, a method. So let me copy all of this. You know how we do it. Duplicate this. This is the iteration statement. For loop. For loop. So next up is what the jump statement. <clears throat> and we're going to be demonstrating the jump statement shortly. So let's look at the jump. So this is wrong. I'll correct this. 
the time you're watching you're watching this on the stem to have been corrected all right so this is wrong the folder for the print is wrong there so let's jump to the jumps let's jump to the jump statement all right in java jump statements are used to unconditionally transfer program control from one point to elsewhere in the program jump statements are primarily used to interrupt loop or switch case instantly java supports three jump statements break continue and return so let's look at the break first so i'm going to copy this code i'm going to copy it And, uh, okay, so I'm gonna write a for loop, which is for write in the a for a equals to which is where it's starting from zero, and um, the condition is an a is less than three increments, and the same condition for b, all right. But in this condition, we are looping a within b. So before we before we show you the if I show you the break statement, so let me let's first print out the let's first print out the uh, the loop, right? We have the for. So this line here, we have a loop within a loop, right? So now the for. So let me print this out. Let's clear this. I run. So as you can see here, we have a loop within a loop. So the first loop, the first loop. As you can see, the first loop, a zero. It did. It did an iteration of the B iteration. It did. The first iteration had the B iteration, right? The second iteration had the B iteration. The third iteration had the, uh, the B iteration. I like that, like that. So you have an iteration within an iteration, All right? So this is it. So in this break statement, you want to break out of this. You want to, you want to um, stop the iteration. You want to stop the second iteration only when the condition is met. Okay. So when the condition is met, and when, what is that condition? When a is equal to b. So let's say, for example, in the first situation, a is zero, right? We print a zero, and for the b, we, in the first situation, a equals to zero. So we, we execute this, and in the first situation of b, b equals to zero. So when a equals to b, when zero equals to zero, we break out of this. That means we stop this situation and we continue back here. So this will automatically increment to one, right? It will increase to one, then it will repeat this. So let me let's let's uh let me run it. So as you can see, when a is equal to zero, it automatically breaks out here and stops this iteration. Stop it didn't continue to until three, it stops it entirely. So that's what the break a break a break um a break statement does. This statement right here, it does it stops an iteration completely, right? Like it does here. So once it stops it, it prints out this line here that it has been done. Increment a, which is now one. So as you can see, a is equal to one. Is a1 equals to b0? No, it continues the iteration. b is increased to 1. Is a1 equals to b1, which is true? It breaks it out. You print a equals to a equals to b, then it prints out this line. It means to stop. So you get the idea. A break statement stops an iteration entirely. Entirely. Right? It stops an iteration entirely. Right? So let's move on to the next. Which is The continue statement is also a for loop, right? Now, what does a uh, continue statement does? <clears throat> what it does is that when a condition is met in an iteration, it skips that iteration. It skips that iteration for the next one, All right? So, although it is not usually advisable to use the break and continue statement as a beginner because it can mess with your head. It skips that. So let me just run it and show you. Now the first one we did, you know, it's printed a equals to b and then skip. It entirely halted that the set our second iteration. But this one, it printed this and continued moving on, right? So which means it told this iteration to increment automatically without, with, um, um, uh, it told it to increment automatically, leaving no, and not to execute any other code in that present iteration, right? So this is the result you get, right? It's a, so it will only skip an index in that iteration. It will not break out the entire, it will not stop the entire iteration, right? As you can see, it continues going on until B3 and for all like that, as you can see, right? So let me put it here, see what I mean. So let me just go back, let me just run this. I hope you get the idea, all right? So the next stop is the return statement. The return statement. The return statement breaks, it stops the loop entirely. Everything is stopped, halted. 
right? Let me copy that code. It's proving difficult to copy. So let me copy it. Let's transform. So this is for a loop within a loop, right? You can play with this at your leisure time, right? So this is a return statement. And what return does, it, it holds, if you have 50 loops within a loop, it will halt the entire thing. If you, if you include the return statement. Once that condition is met, and you include the return statement, that loop will entirely be dissolved, right? So let me run this and show you. So as you can see, look at. Once A equals to B, it stops the entire, it just prints this out and stops, it didn't even break out this loop to continue this loop. This loop, no, it just stops the entire thing. So if you want to grind halt every uh, loop, everything, once a particular condition is met, you use the return statement, all right? I hope it's clear. So uh, we have the exception, okay, let me move this to a method so people can continue. Oh, wait a minute, what is this? Okay, let me, let me, okay, so let's, let's move to, let's move this to jump statements, all right? And as you can see, jump statements are just in loops, all right? They usually use when you are looping in something. Okay, so, um, jump statements. All right, so next up is the exception handling statement. All right. <clears throat> All right. So, um, exception handling. What are exceptions? Exceptions are what happens when your app runs into an error. All right. So, for example, you know that a long occupies eight bits of memory, eight bytes of memory. All right. As I showed you earlier, let me, let me bring that up if I can find it. Okay. Okay, let me bring it up. So let's see. A long occupies eight bytes of memory, right? I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm trying to explain what an exception is. So a long occupies eight bytes of memory, and eight bytes of memory. And you had a, a available RAM. You know your app is run on a random access memory, right? So you, your app was run on a on a RAM on a, on a system on a phone with RAM of five one five hundred megabytes, and a long and you, you wanted to store, wanted to use long variables. Long. I know it stores eight bytes. So if you convert, let me, let me, let me do something. So one byte, one byte, one megabyte is 10 times 10 raised to power, one times 10 raised to power six bytes, right? So if you do the math, you'll be able, you'll only be able to store 62,500,000 long variables on that system before it's run before it crashes so that crash is what we call an exception and what's that exception out of memory because you use too much memory than is available it will ultimately crash so that's what's an exception when you run into an error there are different types of exception all right so sometimes there are input output um exception right the input output exception sometimes you input the value the, the value that was not supposed to be imputed all right so if you had that you know so in order to in the situation where you let's say you are building a bank application right you're building a bank application and the memory on your system was 500 megabytes the ram on your system was 500 megabytes you want to put you want to stop you want to prevent against crashing the of your system you want to say okay if uh the long variables in this app i are beginning to exceed 60 million save them then clear them right save them into a disk then clear them on the ram so that you'll be able to conserve memory. so that's where the catch try catch uh, that's where the try catch comes in. So, in the try catch, you check, you check if a certain condition is met. You check if a certain condition is met before actually, so that you, you prevent against your app from crashing. So, and what's the beauty of this? Once your app crashes, you know your, your users won't be able to access them. And if your app crashes so often, it becomes a big corner for your users. All right. So this is the try catch uh, statement finally in Java. So let's move to the try catch statement. So let me copy this and paste it in. And paste it in. So try catch finally. So um, let me, let me, so this is it. So you can say okay. Let's say you have you want to store an array list of, I don't know. So let's do a for loop of index int zero, right? And we want to say less than. We want to store to memory. We want to store long variables. So let's say um, uh, okay. What did I do here? I didn't do anything. Index. Let's index. If index is less than 62 million, six, let's just say 60 million, right? Because that's approaching the error mode. 60 million, let's do command first before we remove it. 60 million. 
uh, index plus plus. So I'm going to remove the commas, right? Mm, okay. So I'm going to 60 million. So I want to loop through 60 million value. Uh, what is this? Let's say let's just I if was wrong. Oh yeah, error. Index. Let's just call it index once again. So, so let let's say you're storing sixty-two million values, and your only your memory can only accept only uh, sixty-two million. So, you try this. You keep adding. So once it's about to crash, you can tell it to. <coughs> To do something to catch the exception, right? What was the error that it that happened there, right? And this is a fine place to log your error. System dot out dot print line exception. So I'm going to propose it through an uh, out of memory exception. I'm going to do that. You just do true out of memory ex error. Okay, how do I do that? True out of memory. True. Um, so we're going to throw that exception. So this is where you catch the exception, or this is where you log it into your console to know what's actually wrong, right? To know to potentially know how to fix it. And this finally, this is where you put what you want to happen after the error has happened, right? After the error has occurred. Right? So let me put the comments back there so I know what we're doing. So here, I purposely threw a, an, an out-of-memory error, and I caught it. I printed the error here, right? And finally, this is where you execute after um, the error has occurred. This is where you, what should happen, right? So let's just say system dot dot print line. Finally, finally. So let's let me clear this and let's run this. Right. So it we printed this. Now look, your your app ran out of memory, right? Which is what I threw here, right? You click it, it showed me this, right? Then you see the finally, right? This was after the error had been thrown, right? So that's that. That's the duty of the try card. So it will prevent your um prevent your app from crashing, especially when you when you are dealing with user um user when you are dealing with user. You know, users might attempt to do something that their system can't handle or your system can't handle. So the, the try catch system, the try catch statement comes handy, right? And um, I have the throw statement, all right, which is what I just did here. We have the throw statements in Java. This is what I just did here. Let me show you the throw statement. Uh, normally, you would not use this uh throw statement. You will not use it in the normal application. But if you're building something like a library, right? You'll guess what the library means in a minute. In, in, in the further down the line of this course. If you're building something like a library, you would um you want to say you want to caution your users that look you can't do this. That's why you throw an exception to tell them that we can't do that. Or an error was done here. So that's the purpose of throw statements. Right? You throw an exception, you throw an error. You tell them that something is wrong. You can't do this. That's the purpose of the throw statement. Right? But in a normal application you will not you will not write the throw statement. Alright? So um that, uh, that rounds up this long, boring talk, and I hope it wasn't boring for you, but um, I know it's kind of sketchy if you're listening to this for the first time, right? So, summary of the Java syntax. So, now you've known the roots when building an app, right? And um, we would we'll we'll use this foundation we gained in this uh, module to build an app, a quiz app, in the next module. So, I want to congratulate you and say, well done for sticking out, sticking this long. And um, so, finally, let me, let me convert this into a method before we go, and this will be... Um, exception handling statement. So let me exception exception handling statement. Right. So, um, so that's about that. So that's about that. So, um, that's just that. So I'm going to post this on GitHub so that you can copy this without having to type it yourself. Right, but it would be advantageous if you did type it yourself. I'll post it to GitHub and link the uh, GitHub uh, gist in the description below so you can check it out yourself right, and follow along. So uh, I want to say congratulations and um, well done for sticking it out. I want to congratulate you and I would, I would love to see you in the next module, which is building your first app, right? which is a quest, the first quiz app you're going to build. Right? It's going to be the first uh, and probably the last app I'm going to be building in Java. Right? So congratulations. See you in the next module.